Hello, welcome back. We just left off where ever, the Bruno is about to meet his parents looking like a mouse and they're sitting in the lounge and they're about to go approach them. All right, here we go. Only my nose and eyes were above the clasp of my grandmother's handbag, but I had a super view. I could see everything. My grandmother, dressed in black lace, went thumping across the floor of the lounge and halted in front of the Jenkins' table. Are you Mr. and Mrs. Jenkins? She asked. Mr. Jenkins looked at her over the top of his newspaper and frowned. Yes, he said, I am, am Mr. Jenkins. What can I do for you, madam? I'm afraid I have some rather alarming news for you, she said. It's about your son, Bruno. What about Bruno, Mr. Jenkins said. Mrs. Jenkins looked up but went on knitting. What's the little blighter been up to now, Mr. Jenkins asked. Raiding the kitchen, I suppose. It's a bit worse than that, my grandmother said. Do you think we might go somewhere more private while I tell you about it? Private, Mr. Jenkins said. Why do we have to be in private? This is not an easy thing for me to explain, my grandmother said. I'd much rather we all went up to your room and sat down before I tell you any more. Mr. Jenkins lowered his paper. Mrs. Jenkins stopped knitting. I don't want to go up to my room, madam, Mr. Jenkins said. I'm quite comfortable here. Thank you very much. He was a large, coarse man, and he wasn't used to be pushed around by anybody. Kindly state your business and then leave us alone, he added. He spoke as though he was addressing someone who was trying to sell him a vacuum cleaner at the back door. And here is Mr. Jenkins, Mrs. Jenkins, and Grandmama. My poor grandmother, who had been doing her best to be as kind to them as possible, now began to bristle a bit herself. We really can't talk in here, she said. There are too many people. This is a rather delicate and personal matter. I'll talk where I dashed well want to, madam, Mr. Jenkins said. Come on now, out with it. If Bruno has broken a window or smashed your spectacles, then I'll pay for the damage. But I'm not budging out of this seat. One or two other groups in the room were beginning to stare at us now. Where is Bruno anyway, Mr. Jenkins said. Tell him to come here and see me. He's here already, my grandmother said. He's in my handbag. She patted the big floppy leather bag with her walking stick. What the heck do you mean he's in your handbag, Mr. Jenkins shouted. Are you trying to be funny? Mrs. Jenkins said, very prim. There's nothing funny about this, my grandmother said. Your son has suffered a rather unfortunate mishap. He's always suffering mishaps, Mr. Jenkins said. He suffers from overeating, and then he suffers from wind. You should hear him after supper. He sounds like a brass band. But a good dose of castor oil soon puts him right again. Where is the little beggar? I've already told you, my grandmother said. He's in my handbag. But I do think it might be better if we went somewhere private before you meet him in his present state. This woman's mad, Mrs. Jenkins said. Tell her to go away. The plain fact is, my grandmother said, that your son Bruno has been rather drastically altered. Altered, shouted Mr. Jenkins. What the devil do you mean, altered? Go away, Mrs. Jenkins said. You're a silly old woman. I'm trying to tell you as gently as 
possibly can that Bruno really is in my handbag. My grandmother said, my own grandson actually saw them doing it to him. Saw who doing what to him, for heaven's sake, shouted Mr. Jenkins. He had a black mustache which jumped up and down when he shouted. Saw the witches turning him into a mouse, my grandmother said. Call the manager, dear, Mrs. Jenkins said to her husband. Have this mad woman thrown out of the hotel. At this point, my grandmother's patience came to an end. She fished around in her handbag and found Bruno. She lifted him out and dumped him on the glass top table. Mrs. Jenkins took one look at the fat little brown mouse, who was still chewing a bit of banana, and she let out a shriek that rattled the crystals on the chandelier. She sprang out of her chair, yelling, It's a mouse! Take it away! I can't stand those things! It's Bruno, my grandmother said. You nasty, cheeky old woman! You nasty, cheeky old woman, they shouted. He started flapping his newspaper at Bruno, trying to sweep him off the table. My grandmother rushed forward and managed to grab hold of him before he was swept away. Mrs. Jenkins was still screaming her head off, and Mr. Jenkins was towering over us and shouting, Get out of here! How dare you frighten my wife like that! Take your filthy mouth mouse away this instant! Help! screamed Mrs. Jenkins. Her face had gone the color of the underside of a fish. Well, I did my best, my grandmother said, and with that, she turned and sailed out of the room, carrying Bruno with her. And that's the end of that chapter. The next chapter is The Plan. When we got back to the bedroom, my grandmother took both me and Bruno out of her handbag and put us on the table. Why on earth didn't you speak up and tell your father who you were, she said to Bruno. Because I had my mouth full, Bruno said. He jumped straight back into the bowl of bananas and went on with his eating. What a very disagreeable little boy you are, my grandmother said to him. Not boy, I said. Mouse. Quite right, my darling, but we don't have time to worry about him at this moment. We have plans to make. In about an hour and a half's time, all the witches will be going down to supper in the dining room. Right? Right, I said. And every one of them has got to be given a dose of mouse maker, she said. How on earth are we going to do that? Grandmama, I said, I think you are forgetting that a mouse can go places where human beings can't. That's quite right, she said, but even a mouse can't go creeping around on the tabletop carrying a bottle and sprinkling mouse maker all over the witch's roast beef without being spotted. I wasn't thinking of doing it in the dining room, I said. Then where? she asked. In the kitchen, I said, while their food is being got ready. My grandmother stared at me. My darling child, she said slowly, I do believe that turning you into a mouse has doubled your brain power. A little mouse, I said, can go scuttling round the kitchen among the pots and pans, and if he's very careful, no one will ever see him. Brilliant! My grandmother cried out. By golly, I think you've got it. The only thing is, I said, how will I know which food is theirs? I don't want to put it in the wrong saucepan. It would be disastrous if I turned all the other guests into mice by mistake, and especially you, Grandmama. Then you'll just have to creep into the kitchen and find a good hiding place and wait. And listen. Just lie there in some dark cranny, listening and listening to what the cooks are saying, and then, with a bit of luck, somebody's going to give you a clue. Whenever they have a very big party to cook for, the food is always prepared separately. Right, I said. That's what I'll have to do. I shall sit there, and I shall listen, and I shall hope for a bit of luck. It's going to be very dangerous, my grandmother said. Nobody welcomes a mouse in the kitchen. If they see you, they'll squash you to death. I won't let them see me, I said. Don't forget you'll be carrying the bottle, she said, so you won't be nearly so quick and nippy. I can run quite fast standing up with the bottle in my arms, I said. I did it just now, don't you remember? I came all the way up from the Grand High Witch's room carrying it. What about unscrewing the top, she said. 
that might be difficult for you. Let me try, I said. I took hold of the little bottle, and using both my front paws, I found it, I was able to unscrew the cap quite easily. That's great, my grandmother said. You really are a very clever mouse, she glanced at her watch. At half past seven, she said, I shall go down to the dining room for supper with you in my handbag. I shall then release you under the table together with the precious bottle, and for from then on you'll be on your own. You will have to work your way unseen across the dining room to the door that leads into the kitchen. There will be waiters going in and out of that door all the time. You will have to choose the right moment and nip in behind one of them. But for heaven's sake, be sure that you don't get trodden on or squeezed in the door. I'll try not to, I said. And whatever happens, you mustn't let them catch on. Don't go on about it, Grandmama. You're making me nervous. You're a brave little fellow, she said. I do love you. What shall we do about Bruno? I asked her. Bruno looked up. I'm coming with you, he said, speaking with his mouth full of banana. I'm not going to miss my supper. My grandmother considered this for a moment. I'll take you along, she said, if you promise to stay in my bag and keep absolutely silent. Will you pass food down to me from the table? Bruno asked. Yes, she said, if you promise to behave yourself. Would you like something to eat, my darling? She said to me. No, thank you, I said. I'm too excited to eat, and I've got to keep fit and frisky for the big job ahead. It's a big job, all right, my grandmother said. You'll never do a bigger one. Here's the mouse carrying the jar. Very big compared to the mouse. And that's the end of that chapter. We'll be back for the next chapter in the kitchen.